others will banter around, throw the question around to whoever they think is best to answer it, and have a bit of discussion, and hopefully we'll all learn something. Um, or have our questions answered, which is even better. So, um, think of your questions for the Django core developers, um, while the Django core developers get themselves organized. And here they are. <coughs> I'll, I'll kick things off. I'll start with intros, just so everyone knows. Oh, sorry, yeah. intros. Yeah, okay. Take uh, away. So just intros so everybody knows who everyone is here, in case you haven't seen us before. Uh, I'm Russell. You've probably seen me before. Um, next one. Uh, I'm Curtis, also most often known as Funky Bob. I'm Chris, visiting from New Zealand. I'm Marcus, also on IRC, visiting from Germany. Sorry, just fill in that. Uh, Smiley Chris uh, is uh, Smiley Chris, and this is Mar Marcus Holtman, so Marcus H. Uh, hopefully, we'll also be joined by Josh Smeaton in the very near future. No, he's not. No, he's just, he oh, he's not. Oh, okay, sorry, he wasn't. Has been feeling too good. So, okay, we've just got the four of us. Make do. All right. So, um, initial question for the panel. Um, we've heard already today about some things to do with uh, real time processing and and synchronous versus asynchronous. Um, there's been mention of some work Andrew Godwin's been doing about. Uh, channels. Um, where do we see this going? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start here. Um, so, representing the core, uh, the core team, um, technical board here. Andrew's, Andrew's proposition, basically, at the moment, is the best candidate we've seen for a while. No one, I don't think anyone in the core team <coughs> denies that real time is an thing, um, and that the web is increasingly going that way. So, Django needs an answer, or Django is going to go the way of Zoop and all the other dinosaurs before us. Um, so the reason why the why Andrew's proposal is the most interesting we've seen so far is because it's the one that requires the least conceptual shift uh, from what Django already does. And it's also, uh, as, it, as Amber said this morning, it's probably a good enough 80% solution for what most people want real time to do. Like, Yes, there is real time, there's genuine real time where you need you know, complete socket-like behavior from a client, but most people who are in the Django using candidate space are really just looking for um, you know, a, a real time chat client. They want to be able to have a web browser where when I do an update, you get an update and vice versa. So it's not incredibly hideously complex real time, it's a very, very simple message passing type model and what Andrew has proposed there is the best version of that that's requires, you don't have to all of a sudden swallow the red pill and start doing Twisted. We, we leverage a lot of Twisted, but we can sort of keep it away, keep it simple, and still give you enough of the functionality that doesn't you know, cause too many headaches. Um, if anyone wants to add to that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're all done. You're all silent. Um, this, for this to work, we need you to think of questions and to come and line up here, and, and we'll get to them one by one. Um, Okay, that's good. Um, I didn't have my next question read, ready, so um, take it away. On the channel stuff, though, um, what time frame are you thinking of something might come out of that? Because my concern is that you'll go down a path on that, and then you'll have start and people starting to ask you, what about HTTP2? And you've already committed yourself in a direction which actually will not allow you to harness things in HTTP2. Well, I'm not too worried about HTTP2 and whiskey in that regard. Uh, because there's no real fundamental proposal that n seems to fit whatever the community needs. So I think if we want to go in that direction, there should be a proper proposal for how is HTTP2 implemented in, or used in Python in general. Until then, I think this is a fairly certain or fairly good proposal. I was just going to follow up with, from what I've seen of a number of other solutions providing HTTP2 and speedy support is they generally just wrap it as, uh, they, they don't support all the available features of speedy and HTTP2, but we can still get a lot of the, the shared channel and the encryption and, and a few other bits and pieces without having to completely rewrite the stack and, and go as far as Marcus is going. Um, the one that I'd add to that in terms of timeline, it's the eternal thing of open source, the timeline is when someone volunteers to actually do it. Um, it could happen for as soon as 1.9 if someone wants to drop a large pile of cash on someone. Uh, 1.10 is probably more realistic, 
but it won't even happen then if someone can't find you know, it's, it's a non-trivial piece of engineering that needs to happen um, someone needs to pay for it now migrations was, was, we talked about doing migrations for a very long time and it took a Kickstarter to make, basically make that happen you know another Kickstarter may actually be what's necessary to make this happen so thank you Earlier this morning, we heard Amber say that she loved Django Forms, and even though she doesn't do Django stuff, she keeps coming back to that. Um, is Django Forms, is it able to be extracted from Django and used elsewhere, or is there moves within the Django community, or should there be moves within the Django community to start kind of decoupling things and making them more reusable to help that process of engaging with other groups like Twist? I think um, Django's always had a vision that it would be great to have everything totally decoupled and in general we've tried to stay away from having different main, arch main components which are tightly coupled. I think Forms is one that isn't actually that tightly bound to anything, like even settings, there's not a whole lot of things that, that it relies on there. So that could be a, a great project if someone wants to look at what would be the steps of completely decoupling Forms, then I'll be around for the sprints, so. <laughs> I've got, I've got, sorry, sorry. Um, I can tap onto the end of that. Uh, there's a reason historically that it, that it hasn't been decoupable, and that is because the packaging story for, for Python wasn't that good. So roll back 10 years, because we're now talking about 10 years of history. 10 years ago, pip did not exist, and easy install did not work. Um, so now we've got, we can, we can say dependencies, we can say install Django and Django installs Django forms and Django installs Django admin and that will actually work. Now there's a making it actually, like doing the code to make it happen, but it would actually work. The other reason is that as it's currently structured, uh, Django's forms are tightly bound to the model layer, but only because of model forms. Now that's a breakable dependency, as with the settings, it's a breakable dependency, but um, it's one that then would be, that we need to move some things to make that work. So that's where that, if you want to do that project, that's where you're going to find the complications. Um, I also got to throw in, I was telling, was it you? Someone this morning. Um, there was a project that was had a lot of steam for quite a while to actually remove all the settings dependencies from all of Django. So that there were two layers where you had the layer where we're familiar with and then a layer underneath where you could utilise all the tools without the settings. And then I mean, it seemed to be going a lot of good headway, and then it just vanished. I haven't heard from it in months, which is kind of a shame, but I guess they just uh, got a bit scared off by just how much work it was. But that was, they were trying to do it out of templates and models and everything, whereas just taking it out of forms shouldn't be too much of a big idea, big deal. It's just what the I18N and so on and not much else, so. If you want it, go work. <laughs> Just, just on the whole um, deployment um, situation, I was wondering if there's any ideas floating around for um, making a run server or whatever the packaged WSGI um, app server is uh, not, not be something that hasn't got the warning on it, don't use this in production. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so the, essentially, the, the reason we haven't, the reason that warning is there is because writing a web server that is good is hard, uh, if Graham will attest to this. And other people have done it really, really well. There's no reason for Django to reinvent that wheel. There's nothing, we're not doing anything sufficiently new to warrant that. So, so no, run server as currently implemented is not gonna become production rev ready ever because it's just not, that's not an, a, a good use of engineering time. What might be a good use of engineering time is finding an easy way to replace run server so that the it auto loads, it auto works version, and Graham's got his hands in his pants there, um, it, to make, to replace run server with something that is production ready. So replace it with Gunnicorn, replace it with Mod Whiskey Express, replace it with something that is a production ready uh, version that someone else is looking after, so it's not our problem. Um, which is, you know, anything that's not my problem, I love. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably the, the, the longer term picture there. But again, it's, you know, someone's got to volunteer to do it, and at the moment, run server works well enough, so. In that regard, I looked at uh, ModWiski Express this morning, and it has this Django integration, so managed by one ModWiski or something like that, and it just fires up the, 
development or de a web server which also reloads if you want. So. Hi, um, thanks for your work. I started a few projects across the last two years with different versions of Django's and I experienced problems with third party packages. So there's two questions there. Is like, am I doing something wrong finding out which third party package is compatible with which version of Django? And the second question is more like, what is the philosophy with uh, the new releases of Django and backwards compatibility? So, uh, yes, it's all your fault. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that, that is, in fairness, that is actually an area that we haven't done a good job with. And it's something I've pitched a few times. I know there's a group I, I spoke to, uh, the Side Django um, meetup a few weeks back, and I have subsequently had some discussions with some people there about an idea that might run along with this. It is an area of the community management that Django has not done well historically. There is uh, Django packages is out there by Danny, uh, Danny Greenfeld, Audie Roy have done some uh, done some fantastic work there, collating a bunch of packages and getting some you know objective data about the state of completeness and liveliness and whatever else of that code. What it misses you know, or what that data doesn't really currently have is good testing information to say okay yeah Django registration doesn't work on Django 1.78 whatever whatever version it broke on, um, and it's t in terms of Django's own development process we don't have other people's packages as part of our development process, which we possibly should. Um, this is one thing that the Flask community does really well, is that they've got a subset, well, actually, I think it's two, two subsets, one's a superset of the first, the second one's a subset of, superset of the first, where... <laughs> Just go ahead. I are a mathematician. Um, <laughs> the... Um, where they've nominated that these are the packages that are sufficiently important that we're going to run the test suite against these packages before we do the next release to verify when, what things are going to be breaking, both from the perspective of being able to say, this works with Django 1.8, it works with Flask you know, version whatever, um, but also to help identify the problems that other people are going to have to say, okay, well now we're getting this, this regression. Okay, is that because we've changed an API, we haven't documented the change? Is it because you've actually been using an unofficial API? You know, whatever the cause of the problem is, either you've got to fix it or we've got to fix it, but either way there's something that's got to be fixed or you just, we're abandoning that project and that comes out of our supported pool. That's something that I would like to see Django pick up um, in terms of there are, yes, there is a, a huge range of tens of thousands of packages on PyPI that are tagged Django. Of those, you could probably narrow down a set of 50. That would be the you know 95% case of stuff that everyone uses. And I would like to see us running those test suites against pre-production versions of Django once we hit beta and things like that to be able to say, yes, it works. Even if it's not automated, even if it's just, you know, when we hit beta, we send an email to everybody who's the registered owner saying, you need to run, it's on you now, you've got to run the test suite against 1.8 and then we'll, we'll tick the box and say, yes, it's done, okay, we're all, we're all good to go. Um, so that, in its finding which, which 50 packages it is, is where it gets problematic because then we're starting to get into opinions about who's, you know, which, which Facebook sign-in library do you do, do you use, do you have multiple ones. But that in itself would be a really useful contribution to the community because it's not just a matter that, you know, there are five, you, you want to sign into Facebook. There are ten libraries that will sign into Facebook. Only two of them are actually used by anybody who's responsible. And if you're the person who's coming to the community for the mo like for the first time, you don't know that the one you want is the one that Yanis Lidell has committed to because you don't know who Yanis Liddell is. Um, so being able to curate that information to say, yes, there are horses for courses, you might, have a deceit, you might have a reason for using a different package, but absent of other information, if you want to do Facebook sign-ins, you should be using this package. Um, and then curating that information, being opinionated, uh, but cur no, curated op opinions and letting other people say, no, we disagree with this for these reasons or whatever, uh, I think that's got a real good space as a project that could be filled. And I know some people from Side Django are talking about it. If we can sprint about it on Monday and Tuesday, that'd be fantastic. I've even got a domain for you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Just before Tyson makes it his way to the microphone, um, we've already heard today a couple of mentions of that might be coming in 1.9 or maybe it's going to be in 1.10. Um, I don't know what other people are like in terms of following what's going on in the development scene, you know, behind, before an actual release, you know, a major release comes out. But is there, 
without making any, any firm commitments, because obviously there's no such thing in the open source world, um, is there anything you can tell us about some things we might be expecting to see coming up in 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, how big do you want to go? <laughs> so well, uh, 1.9 has, as mentioned earlier, the JSONB field, uh, some other Postgres specific things. There are access mi mixings for the, or permission mixings for the class-based generic views. Um, the Django admin got a new theme committed a couple of hours ago by Tim. Um, I'm just pulling up the release notes now to check. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, password validation. So, uh, so set requirements for your users to have on their passwords, make them have at most 50, uh, at, at least 20 characters. So, lock all your users out. <laughs> So what's the timeline on the, the form template rendering? Uh, is form template? What? Sorry. Um, <laughs> is, that is, that is that actually on so the path? I knew someone was working on it. I know I was working on it. So so yeah. Please don't mumble. Do, do feel free to step up to the microphone. Yeah, no, so you're, that, you're, you're, that was, you're that, that was secret inside baseball. Microphone. We couldn't possibly I'll do that in front of a microphone. <laughs> um, somebody has been working on, on doing template-based form rendering in trunk, but I'm not sure what status that's up to. If it's even, I don't think it's 1.9. Yeah, no. someone, someone picked it. It was originally a summer of code project ah. two years ago. Someone picked it up recently because we fixed the dependency problem, which was we can't do it with Django's templates. We can do it with Ginger. Now we can use Ginger. Let's fix that problem. Okay. Uh, we've also got uh, a, a new signal hook to be able to perform an action at the end of a transaction commit. Oh, yeah. um, password validation, um, permissions mix-ins. We've finally added actual live permissions mix-ins for class-based views instead of telling everyone to roll their own. New admin styling and then a bunch of little features. A lot of lot of internal tweaks around the way expressions work uh, and f functions f functions work so that you can do a lot more interesting things with aggregations and a lot more interesting things with expressions as well. Uh, longer term, obviously, real time is one thing that's on the list. Uh, composite fields, any release now, we're going to commit that. <laughs> <I> sh <laughs> for sure, absolutely. Um, that's one that almost got in for 1.7, but then kind of collided with about three other patches and then we lost it. I lost its momentum again. Um, Task API? No, Tasks API, maybe. Uh, it's, like, it's got to get a little bit beyond, but the idea that in the same way that we've got a caching API, and it doesn't matter whether you use a file-based cache or a memory-based cache or a mem cache or even Redis, because the APIs basically get set, blah, blah, blah. There's a, where there's a project going on to have a version of that for background tasks um, to say, okay, essentially Celery or versions thereof, so that you can just say, okay, I'm Django projects, just put this in the background, do some background work, that function. Um, implemented with backends in Celery and uh, RQ and all the other variations that are out there, but providing it as a common API, abstracting the basic functionality so that you can just, hey, do it. Um, yeah. I think that in the past we've had some good podcasts that were running and and provided a lot of this information and I'd encourage anyone if they're, if they're passionate about this sort of community work that you can start something like that and if you if you can stick with it, that would be the kind of thing we'd give you permissions to post on the Django blog so that we'd would be able to disseminate this rather than having four core developers stand up and tell you at, at PyCon. So yeah, if, if community involvement is something that you're passionate about, it's it's an area which you can do without needing to delve right into the code, but you can still pay a, play an integral part of the community. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Um, with Russell, you mentioned that perhaps there were 50 core packages, like separate packages, that uh, could be considered as part of test suites or otherwise. The author of Piprot, Brenton Cleland, and myself have been talking about um, a new project which we dubbed as Django Stables um, to do pretty much what you're talking about, horses for courses. Um, so to have some repository of information um, also to provide some of that thing that I talked about in my talk where I said um, you might be able to do something of add a package and it just knows how to use it and uh, go and add it to your settings or otherwise. So um, I, I guess I'm saying I accept and if anyone else wants to join me on the uh, coming Monday and Tuesday... Is this a comment or a question? <laughs> that we can start on Django Stables. You said you have a domain name and things, so hand it over.
and, and the question he neglected to ask was, do you think that's a good idea? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes absolutely. And I, the sad to say is I think you might actually have an even better name than the one that I had. So it's Stables, if only because it would annoy the living Jesus out of Adrian. It makes me very, very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's get a posse and make this happen. Um, maybe just <clears throat> philosophically, um, last last year, I think it was last year, pretty sure it was last year, Funky Bob gave a talk about the state of rest, or maybe it was the year before. No, that before. Was the year before. Um, and then since when, yeah, it was. Um, and then since then we've seen, say, Andrew's work fold in um, migrations into uh, core and trunk. I was just wondering, like, how important is it for there to be a rest or API view creator as part of trunk in Django? Or are we happy to sort of let the ecosystem play out and see who will survive? Um, so what I've observed over the last few years, and it's pretty much been the general trend, is anything that can live outside of Django as a third party app should continue to live outside of Django as a third party app. Uh, obviously migrations rolled in because it was a tremendously better solution once it became part of Django and was allowed to massively, invasively change how things were built. Um, that was not something that would, could have happened if you, if you heard Andrew's talk. Whereas the REST frameworks, mine and, and Andrew's and, and all the rest of them, um, and Tom's, they will work fine as a third party app. There's no reason to bring them internally. Um, and as such, you know, the obvious benefits, they're not tied to the release, there's not extra burden on everybody and, and so on. So I don't see tools like that M um, becoming part of the core anytime ever really. Whereas if there is something like the channel solution, but that's already a external. Yeah, it's, it is external. It's external, so that doesn't even, I mean that, you can do that without even bringing that into core. So if it can be kept as a third party app, it's best that way. Um, certainly some of the stuff that got moved out of Contrib maybe not in the best possible way, but that is, still an option to move more stuff out of Contrib rather than more stuff in. Yeah. Actually, I'll just, just add to that. Um, the, essentially, like the, we, we, the things that we're adding are things that are designed to be points of abstraction. You know, a task API, yes, is a new thing, and yes, Celery is out there, but what we're adding is the abstraction API so that Django users know there's a common version. Migrations was moved into core because pretty much every website known to man needs to have a migration, uh, no, a great migration path, and it's just easier if everyone's on the same one. REST framework, one, like everything Curtis said, plus one, um, but it's, it's also, it is vibrant outside the community. And part of, one of the things that we've actually changed with the core team uh, in the last year is that um, the Tom Christie, the guy behind REST framework, is officially now actually a member of the Django core team. He's not a committing member, he doesn't have the commit bit, but he is part of the core team so that he can, you know, as part of this broader ecosystem of tools that is Django, he is representative of the things that are happening in REST. And if there are other large projects we're looking to sort of absorb their members and, and be able to say, yeah, when he talks, pay attention to him because he's important. Um, the closest we might get to bringing it into core would be to take the project under Django's repository to sort of make it a little bit more official about this is where we're storing the code. Hey, no, really, it's important. It won't ever be in the Django.contrib.rest as a, as a package, I, I would suspect. Again, also partially because pip now works and you can say import you now REST framework and it yeah, does, so. Yeah. Just yeah, the following comment is more like, like the role that we see or we as uh, common code use Django for is increasingly as an API. Creator. And so, I mean, views and function-based views and class-based views were an important discussion in Django a little while back. And then there are also uh, class-based views and function-based views in, in um, Tom Christie's DRF. And yes, yeah, wondering, like, given the importance as Django and its role in um, server-side computing, where where do we um, should we adopt it or should Django adopt it as like a primary function, like they did with the migrations? Yeah. Um, okay. So I've, I've actually got some. You haven't got anywhere near enough time, and it's almost a talk in itself about my, my, my view on where that goes. I teased it last year when I did the class of views talk, and I've done nothing on it. Um, so if you want to have a discussion about where the future goes with that, I'd love to have a conversation with you about where Django fits into that picture. Um, and But again, I think it is actually an external thing that is then it's Django as server-side plus REST framework plus this extra bit. 
and the extra bit is the bit that's not currently there, but I think we, we there's definitely room for a project there, which would be you know, great. Okay. Almost out of time, but Tyson promises me this is a very quick question. Can we please have a standard way of handing off from urls.py into something that can handle WebSockets? I, I think the, the core problem, of course, is that, that WSGI itself doesn't really properly support um, WebSockets. Graham will back me up on this, I'm sure. No, right. Um, so by the time you've reached urls.py, it's too late. You're already inside Whiskey, and you can't properly handle WebSockets. I know there are possible ways to hack around it and there's all these other solutions, but it really should be happening before it gets there. So with the um, channel solution, that's happening there. It's, it, you're getting in before it reaches urls.py, and you can handle that earlier on. But um, by the time you've got there, it's too late to hand off. That's, yeah, that's kind of the big, that's the big conundrum of Python in the web at the moment is that our standard, WSGI, is, it does not work on, on um, uh, real-time socket-based stuff. We need, hang on, Graham's not looking, WSGI 2. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go, I've just got post-traumatic stress going there now. Um, so yeah, the, it, there is a standard that is required there to replace WSGI. Um, that's a tar pit that no one wants to go into because we've tried a few times and it's a tar pit. Um, maybe something might come out of Django if we can standardise something that we've done and then, hey, everyone will just adopt it, but a lot of people will reject it on the grounds that it's Django, so, you know. Uh. We are out of time. Thank you all for your questions, but let's all thank the impromptu panel of Django core developers. Thank you.